when we're ready to start um, with the report and then we'll get started. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us um, for the Information Advantage panel. Uh, my name is Major Christopher Kane. I go by Citizen. Um, I'm going to be kind of the director f MC for the panel today. What I want to kind of highlight though is that this is an open forum, so please come and go as, as available or as you have time. Here's going to be the, the major topics. We have 10 different briefers in five different groups today. Um, and then we're going to cap it off with a discussion with experts from the um, Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate for a discussion on the new ADP 313 Information Advantage um, Doctrine. Some quick ROEs, though, as we get started. Um, as I already mentioned, this is open forum. Um, come and go throughout the day as um, the sessions interest you. Please hold all questions until the end. Each um, session will have a deliberate Q&A available built into the session. But because we're doing that open forum, we're going to be str uh, strictly adhering to that timeline. So who, for people who want to come in later, they know exactly when they can start. Um, if we have questions that run over and the discussion's good, um, we're going to be moving it out outside. You can continue to engage with the panel members or with the, the speakers. And then all of us are going to be available at lunchtime down at the joint bar. Uh, based on the Brits being there, we might flex a little bit based on that location. So we'll let you know. We might um, just move it in here um, for lunch. Um, and then you can come and get questions if you have them. So as I mentioned, um, we're going to be presenting all of our uh, research that we did for these last six months um, in the Information Advantage Scholars Program. We're going to be starting with um, two of our research projects, which were based on trust in AI and the um, biases that are in inherent in AI programming. So my thesis was on trust in human autonomy teaming. There were two major premises that I had um, starting with this thesis idea. The first is that. Um, we are going to be moving towards augmented decision making with the military. And that inherent into that decision making and those teams, trust is going to be a fundamental factor of how effective those teams become. Um, research indicates that there's a lot of different things that influence that kind of trust in human autonomy teaming. Uh, with the characteristics of the human operators, the characteristics of the AI systems, the interactions between the two, and then the environmental context. So that's kind of how I framed my research. Uh, but then it's a pretty new area of research, so I also had to go to human-to-human -human team relationships and see what kind of insights we could learn from how human-to-human -human teams build trust to apply them to human autonomy teaming. So based on the literature, I adapted a couple different models into this basic model of trust in a human autonomy team uh, construct. There's the human factors, things like the demographics, their personality type, their experience with AI, or their understanding with AI in general. Um, the AI factors are things like performance. So a demonstrably reliable AI system should build more trust. The level of communication that the AI system has with its human operator. The level of automation. So what I mean by that is how involved the human is in the decision making process, whether they're human in the loop, human on the loop, or human out of the loop. And then the transparency. So how the AI system communicates to the participant that what it's doing based on its data set and its calculations. All of that exists in the environmental construct, which can be broken up into things like the complexity. So when we look at how complex the system and the team has to work in, in an operating environment, the degree of decisional freedom, so how much choice that human actually makes when they're interacting with the system, and then the risk involved in that ultimate decision making. So you can see that the human should be doing a feedback loop with the AI system when they're part of a team where they gain experience with the system and then hopefully the system uh, provides reliability and increases their experience with that system and builds trust. So I did an experiment where I did uh, surveys to CGSC students um, and I randomized different components of this model in order to test how significant they were in um, and validate the model. The things that I changed were the level of experience that a human, ha that the participant had with the system, um, the amount of transparency that the system provided back in the vignette, and then I also measured their digital literacy in order to get a baseline understanding that they have in some of these technologies. Unfortunately, what I found is that none of those actually were significantly predicted like the literature, but I did find some other interesting um, components. There was also a uh, self-reported trust survey, and one of those components measured the trust in AI systems 
that trust as self-reported was a significant predictor of their overall choice, irrespective of whether or not um, I, I modified any of the other um, control measures. So if I modified transparency either to high or low, that didn't matter. Really what mattered was their baseline level of trust, and that's what drove the decision making. The other thing that I found that was very interesting was that the level of transparency seems to indicate that there's a little more uh, feedback of that kind of component. Even though the research says that transparency is something that builds trust, it might be a little more complicated than the initial research uh, indicates. And what I mean by that is I had a low, medium, and high version of transparency, and across all three of those uh, models, I still had the same number of qualitative responses, or roughly the same number of qualitative responses, indicating the desire for more transparency. So a counterintuitive approach might, uh, understanding might be that someone who actually has more understanding in an AI system might actually require or demand a different level of transparency from a system that they're working with than would be implied otherwise. The other indication that I had throughout a lot of the qualitative responses that was kind of nested within the desire for transparency was the understanding of uh, the complexity of AI and the ability to handle AI. So what I mean by that is um, in the qualitative responses, there were two different ways that I coded it. They, people either had a positive view of AI's ability to handle a complex operating environment like we would find in a military situation or they had a negative view of that, and they said, AI won't ever be able to model this complexity. Um, depending on that, those were predictive of their overall baseline and trust. So if someone had a very high view of AI's ability to understand the complexity of an operating environment, they also had a high level of trust, and conversely, if they had a negative view of that, then they had a, a lower view of trust. And those were significant findings. The other thing that came up, and will lead into our next presentation, is that there was a constant theme of people indicating that they did not trust AI because of the inherent biases that AI might be programmed with, which leads into Major Bashir's uh, discussion of AI biases and how we can start to mitigate those um, for the military intelligence community. All right, thank you, Major Kane. Uh, yes, so my particular thesis and study focused on how the military intelligence community can help mitigate unintended bias within machine learning systems that are operating within the joint intelligence process. Uh, I pull predominantly from two theories, that being machine learning theory as well as partic participatory design theory. And what I mean by participatory design theory, uh, I'm talking about bringing in non-AI technical experts into the design pipeline to work with AI technical experts to design the machine learning system. And there are four categories uh, that I referred to within the participatory design um, theory, and I'll get into those once I start discussing my case studies. This is just uh, the model of the joint intelligence process. It is a cyclical model. It starts with the planning and direction phase and then goes in a clockwise manner and then ends with evaluation and feedback. This is my overall methodology. I did conduct a qualitative case, uh, case study followed by a cross-case synthesis. So starting, uh, my primary research question was how can the military intelligence community help mitigate unintended bias within machine learning systems operating within the joint intelligence process? So to do this, uh, I created a set of six criteria, screening criteria, to find appropriate situations in which I identified three case studies from commercial industry specifically. Um, and from there, I took each of those case studies and looked at them and looked for the presence of three case study uh, variable analysis. So that my first one was the presence of unintended bias. When I'm referring to unintended bias, by the way, I'm referring to a flaw in the system that could detrimentally impact uh, the intelligence analysis. Um, so looking for the unintended present or unintended bias, the second one would be participatory design. And then the third one is the presence of any uh, related tasks that could correlate to the joint intelligence process, any of those phases. Uh, once I identified the presence of all of those, as well as various sub-variables of the, each of those variables, um, then I created three charts, and that led into my cross-case synthesis, in which I cross-referenced them. And it was a two-part approach. Uh, the first part of the approach was to identify which unintended biases may appear in which JIP phases. And then the second approach was understanding which mitigation strategies or best practices uh, could be employed against which unintended biases. And the overall intent of this, or the result, was hopefully to identify where in the, mil the military intelligence community where we could identify 
unintended bias as we're working with machine learning systems in the joint intelligence process, and which mitigation strategies we might be able to employ uh, to mitigate those biases. So this leads into my data analysis and findings. So specifically, uh, for the three case studies, so my case, first case study uh, involved 412 Food Rescue, which is a nonprofit that helps uh, basically deliver food to organizations in need. They were working with, with some ac academic technical advisors to create an algorithm for a machine learning system or for their food rescue app is what it became, to fairly allocate food uh, to those organizations. Uh, the participatory or the particular bias that they were concerned what, with was more algorithm focused. Uh, they wanted to make sure that they were what they considered to be equitable, um, fairly allocating food across the board. Uh, for the the machine learning system, the app that they uh, were creating, it worked mainly with collection, so collecting information from donors as well as from recipients, as well as uh, processing and exploitation as well, and then dissemination and integration. And the participatory design that I identified in this particular case study, uh, there was actually two of them. So it could be co-creation and collaboration. So co-creation and collaboration, this involves uh, bringing in those non-technical experts into the design process at the very beginning of the design process um, and working with them throughout the entire pipeline, development pipeline. For case study two, uh, so Google has struggled with its photo imagery machine learning system, specifically its photo apps. So one of, one of the ways it wanted to help mitigate any unintended bias that they found, um, specifically within the data set, its training data set, uh, was to create this crowdsource app. And crowdsource app is considered a form of contribution participatory design, so that's where you're bringing in individuals into a particular part of the pipeline to assist uh, with an error or an issue you found in, in that particular aspect. So in this regard, it was bringing the public in to help them di help Google diversify its training data. And then the machine learning systems, uh, JIP related tasks for like the photo app identified specifically that it was executing collection and processing and exploitation tasks. And then there's the third case study. And this is where MIT researchers conducted two user audits against ultimately five companies on their facial recognition software. And so the intent of this was they wanted to give feedback to those companies and then to improve those systems and also educate the public on the limitations of facial recognition and also inspire government regulation as to what would be appropriate use of facial recognition. Um, so the bias concern there was also data set focused. Those researchers found that uh, they, those companies were not using sufficiently diverse data in their training data. The machine learning tasks were collection and processing and exploitation as well. And the participatory design, this is considered a form of consultation uh, because the users, you had basically end users or entities outside of the company conducting this user audit, giving feedback to them. And also consultation is considered where you can you educate the public or inspire government regulation as well. So for my conclusions and recommendations, uh, for my first case study, uh, I did find that the bias was predominantly with it with the algorithm, that was where the main concern was, while the other two is mainly in the data or the data sets, whether that be training data or the validation data sets. And then for the various, I did identify various unintended biases, I didn't specify them on this slide, but there were various unintended biases that I was able to identify uh, through public documents uh, that correlated and appeared to uh, in JIP phases of collection, processing, and exploitation, as well as dissemination and integration. Those were the three phases. And then I also identified that co-creation and collaboration, they're more proactive in nature because you're bringing in the non-technical experts at the very beginning of the design pipeline versus contribution and consultation are more reactionary in nature. It's usually when the machine learning system has already been implemented and you're trying to correct an error in the system. As for recommendations, I do recommend that the AI technical designers who are working on machine learning systems uh, for the intelligence community, that they do work with the intelligence community, like bringing in these people and consulting with them, working with them, uh, so that they can improve those systems. And then employing these participatory design best practices specifically where appropriate. Again, it, it might not be that one is better than the other. It might just be, is the system being designed at the beginning now, in which case bring in those non-technical experts, or is there already an error identified in the system, in which case the reactionary would be more appropriate. 
And then probably I would also recommend focusing on uh, mitigating unintended bias within data first. Perhaps focus on those. Two of the case, two of the three case studies had issues with their data versus the algorithm. And then those last two bullets are just talking about conducting further studies. I absolutely recommend repeating the study uh, using proprietary and, class and or classified information as needed uh, to get specific details as to which unintended biases actually appeared or which may have appeared that I wasn't able to identify in the study, as well as uh, what would be appropriate use of these machine learning systems within actual intelligence tasks. So if there are and then this concludes our formal portion of our briefings. If we can now go into questions and answers. Yeah, so just, I forgot to highlight the fact that uh, your guys' mics are live, so if you ask questions, you can use those in order to make sure that everybody can hear it. I have to turn it on. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Um, great job, guys. Um, my question, first question is for Citizen. So you mentioned that the bias, that people were concerned about their trust in AI based on the probability of biases. Um, how, how many people or how much of your response was that prevalent in or was that only prevalent in people who didn't trust AI? Does that question make sense? Were there a lot of people who recognized across the school that biases is a concern for AI? No, so as a, it was significant enough that it became, when I did my qualitative um, analysis, it was a unique code specifically to highlight AI bias. I should also mention that like subjectivity and human bias was also something that people commented on and they would tend to prefer AI because it would eliminate a human subjective bias. But I would say that um, I looked at the numbers yesterday, I think, to prep for this question. I think it was like 7% of the respondents. So it wasn't an extraordinary number. Um, it was enough that that we had to, that I had to code for it though specifically. So do you think the general population in the military or the army um, recognizes that this is a concern with AI moving forward and us integrating it into our operations? Yeah, so what I saw in addition to people that specifically highlighted AI bias in basically those words or in some form of those words was a more persistent um, indication that transparency and things that talking about the programming. So. My guess would be that that's an, um, potentially just a lower understanding, so that they, they have an intuition about it, but they don't maybe have the understanding in the formal AI systems to know and call it AI programming bias in those, in those words. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Good. And then okay. one question for you, Beth. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're looking at data sets for the future, um, are there any indicator sh indicators that you saw that would ahead of time predict that this data would be discriminatory in some way? For example, I sometimes we buy data sets or we might build our own. Was there any indicators that you felt like you could look at really early on that you're like, this data would not um, be sufficient moving forward? Size, um, that sort of thing. Um. I don't have any like specific measurements as to like the particular data. I think it also depends on what your machine learning system is for. Uh, the technical designers might be able to identify that right away, but as for the users, like the actual general military intelligence community, uh, we probably actually have to use the system first before we are able to identify that there was an issue. Thank you. So there's actually, yeah, very much an education component to this, and there is a DoD AI education strategy, and it actually does include uh, both design and bias in its curriculum. So it did not specify exactly what's going to be taught, but I'm really hoping that they do get into this type of detail so that people, especially end users, understand that they can help contribute and uh, improve these systems. But I, I agree there will be an education component to it as well.
that was also pretty much the specific focus of mine was there, whether or not education at a certain level is required or effective in building the trust for AI systems. So if we are expecting military members to work with these AI systems, do they need to have a basic level of understanding? Is that even a requirement? Was one of the things I was looking at. Um, so when I mentioned my, my survey used digital literacy, that was an Air Force survey. Um, and it was very big, big picture, because what I wanted to do s to start with was kind of do as broad of a measurement of that literacy of those kind of systems as I could, because that would get more bang for the buck, right? So if, if we found that digital literacy was predictive of someone's trust in using these AI systems as a level of understanding, then it also has a lot of other effects that we wanna, we wanna do in teaching those kind of things. What I found was that was not predictive. It was probably too broad. But a lot of the, in, the research kind of indicates in the qualitative responses that there probably is a level of understanding in AI that determines a baseline level of trust. And so now I think the further research from my end is how do we measure that? And then more importantly, how do we, how do we train it to the members? And that's, yeah, that's parts that from the DOD writ large, we're trying to um, figure out those education strategies, but I, I, don't, I don't think we have the answer yet. Also because I don't think we know at what level it needs to happen, and I think that's the biggest question still up in there, is how much of machine learning do you need to know to start working with them and trust them? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Answers your question in that the question is not answered, yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, I have another question. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just my hand up here. Okay, um, that's fine. Follow up on the topic of trust. Um, you mentioned two different kinds of lack of trust, one being a blind, uh, well, two different kinds of trust. Uh, blind trust, hey, I appreciate you very much. Um, there's sort of a blind trust in AI where that person doesn't really know what the system is, but yeah, sure, I trust it. Sure. Army says, use it. Um, and then there's a, a, a there's, there's uh, a lack of trust that comes from actually knowing the system and knowing actually, no, this is the piece of it that you can't trust, but now that I can identify that, I can work around that. So I wonder if you explored that at all in your Yeah, I, I kind of had a hypothesis. Unfortunately, the data didn't really um, clarify that, but I, I do think that there probably is probably a level of diminishing returns where once you become too much of an expert in AI, then maybe you start to lose trust in it mm -hmm. because you understand it too well. So again, maybe there's a sweet spot where we want to educate people to trust. Um, but to, to kind of that basic blind trust, I think more importantly, there's, there's a couple different, um, the, lead, the literature kind of suggests there's a couple different strategies for what develops trust in um, people. And I think the research also kind of indicated that different people have different things. So like certain people might need to interface and work and gain experience with the system before they're gonna trust it. Some people might just go in with that basic trust. And another topic of further research is if they do have that baseline trust, is there an underlying cause that we can measure so we know it? Because I don't know that we want people to go in just completely blind mm -hmm. and say like, I I'm gonna trust it no matter what. We want them to be critical um, and evaluate the system that they're working with to be good teammates with it. Certainly. Does that answer that sure. question? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? I've got one for um, Major Bashir. So your research looked at how you can mitigate unintended bias in machine learning programs for the joint intelligence process, but you highlighted that you think that the preventative measures is uh, co-creation would help mitigate some of those biases and rather than trying to fix the problem on the back end. Is there any look at modifying the DOD software development process or JSON's process to deliberately require that sort of co-creation up front to help mitigate anything? That's a great question. So yeah, actually I didn't get, unfortunately I didn't get into that with my particular study, but that is absolutely something that I'm very interested in, especially with the defense acquisition system and seeing if how they bring in those, for example, the COEs or the sta various stakeholders into the design process. That's something that I would really like to look into and see how much they do that already or if that's something that we could develop in the future. Thank you. I get to ask one. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, this is pretty neat that we were able to do the pairing, and I didn't anticipate this working out, but um, <laughs> at all. Um, but in kind of your discussion, as you're kind of looking at um, the one end of it, here's this training and the lift that we've got to look at in terms of trust in AI, and then getting underneath the hood in terms of the data. You know, what would you guys collect? What would you recommend that, you know, in terms of a pathway ahead that even here at CGSC that we should be taking on when we're dealing with this topic of AI and ML? And I'm not talking about it from a Pete Singer, Fichten kind of stuff. I'm talking about it realistically, everything we know right now about core and what little we do see out of AOC. What, what would be some thoughts that you guys would have based off of your own research and kind of understanding requirements? say taking, well, once the AI education policy or strategy is actually implemented and refined, I think bringing that, the curriculum into CGSC would be very valuable, even if it's just introductory lessons, for example. So they do have it broken down by archetype as well. So um, kind of introducing the cohort to those particular subjects with it uh, and where they would fall in the archetypes. I think I think one of the things that's probably going to be a driving factor into kind of the integration into PME will be the fielding of these systems, right? Like I looked in a hypothetical AI system that I put 10 years fielded into the future that had certain capabilities that isn't fielded right now. Um, so it's hard to, I think, try to train people in this kind of environment to understand or talk about these hypothetical systems that might or might not actually ever be used by them in the construct. So I think it'll probably just naturally occur that as we start to field some of these systems and they get familiar with them, then we'll find the touch points where we can fit kind of that education piece into PME. But I think if we try to do, we can do a proactive kind of approach of some of the general topics and we probably do need to do that as a more general idea, but I don't know that we need to do it at a, certainly at depth for everybody yet. Sir, that made me um, think of a question, citizen, with your response, which is um, if the scenarios that we're um, being educated with here at CGSC are supposed to be like five years in the future, you know, how important is it that we have these conversations even if we don't know? But I'd imagine five years in the future we're looking at very different, hopefully, very different technology than we're seeing now. And so how do we integrate that, would you recommend, into the scenarios? Well, I mean, like, that's kind of a can of worms that I think every AOC student probably <laughs> grapples with is why are we fighting an adversary that has these capabilities five years in the future, but we're training to what we have now. And I think it's, it's probably just based on the pragmatic approach where we can't, where we can't have everybody knowledgeable about these probably, you know, special access programs that aren't fielded in order to integrate them effectively without a lot more issues. So unfortunately, I just don't know that. A question for Mr. M more than you, sir. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. You know, hard truth is uh, to kind of go back to the AI strategy, education strategy. Um, I think it's just like your experience, you know, when uh, uh, Dr. Hohill and uh, Mr. Morcos came down and gave you 10 hours of nothing but rolled homogeneous deep dive in AI, right? Um, all of a sudden, we're looking at k-means k clustering and linear regression and classification problems, right? And I think there's a there's a, a touch point somewhere in there where you know we have to be scienced up at a level. And in this crew, you guys, some of you already had that, some of you had not. Um, but then how do you turn that into then the learning things that we see in a tactical operational, you know, uh, scenario? You know, and I think of things like distribution of fuel. I think of things like the EM environment in terms of the data sets that have to be crunched and sussing out which ones are relevant and not being able to humanly do that. I also think of complexity. Uh, like, for example, in the information environment, instead of just simply looking at um, scenarios that give us kind of the can, piece, the can piece of what's opening up, what's happening geopolitically, but really what's happening kind of locally, you know, uh, 
And, and I think this is the part where, again, not to get inside of our own AAR and hot wash, but one of the things about your research, it kind of leads to this. This is the edge portion that we're seeing right now. And we've got a crew here from ARI, is that correct? So this is kind of where, uh, how do you tie the research that we see at ARI, at KU, at UMKC, et cetera, to then the very practical kinds of problems that we see not you know, how do I ensure I get my parts on time and all that, which is important. Those things are important, but then how do you find the pathway, you know, that really deal with some of our problems? And we saw a little bit of that, you know, and it's kind of an interesting piece as I'm listening to both of you. And again, it was just, just the fact that we had done this by happenstance, it just got me thinking about what's the next set of topics that we need to follow up on and the place that we really need to go in order for us to kind of start pushing things inside of a very, very tight and cramped curriculum with limited amount of time, and maybe we won't be able to get to that. But how do you get that castor oil in, in places where people all of a sudden can see that? Uh, math for majors, the quant class that De Desfem teaches, I forgot that they actually taught that. But how do we take that and lay that against some problems? You know, the science, not necessarily the art, but the science portion of it. And everything we're talking about here is science, you know, hard application. So. Well, I think, I think one of the best things that came out of that AI education strategy was the acknowledgement that there's different levels of um, people in it integrated into that project cycle mm -hmm. from the developers themselves down to the end users and the acknowledgement that those have different education requirements. And so I think that's just the final step that both of our research is indicating too is now how do we, how do we find out who those members are in the military at which, le which level and then what kind of training they require? Because there is the, the understanding that everybody, because it was a national strategy too as well, yeah. there's the, the national strategy is that at a certain point everybody in their daily life is gonna be interacting with these systems to the point that they should have a basic understanding of them in order to be effective members in integrating it's just what kind of education requirements does that demand? And then as we look into the military, where do we actually layer additional education requirements to be efficient? Um, so we probably have time for one more question um, and then we'll, we'll start to do the break and hand over if there's another question. If not, I actually have one for Beth, but I'll leave it up to you. Okay, so I had a question. Um, you talked briefly about, <laughs> you talked briefly about uh, doing it on classified um, and proprietary systems. Mm -hmm. When we talk about that level of integration, are there any difficulties you foresee with kind of doing AI development and the participatory design at a classified level? Like how do you foresee overcoming those challenges? Um, I think that's why I also focused on the military intelligence community because they will have access to the classified information. So um, assuming that the technical designers, they want to use a participatory design. Uh, so I don't think that would be a limiting factor in that regard as long as the technical designers were open. Do to you think we have enough technical designers with those kind of accesses to develop the system? Hmm. That's a good question. I'd have to look at that. Okay. But um, if they are using it for classified purposes, they might initially it might be unclassified initially and then move into then a classified system. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was my question is like, do, uh, and I don't know enough about the current way we're developing systems, but are we developing unclassified and then applying a classified data set? Or is it, is it a classified ecosystem from the beginning? And do you think there's a difference with that as far as effective? Um, it might be a little bit of both. I'm yeah. not gonna say that it's not because I, I actually do not know okay. specifically because I did not look at that, but uh, that is interesting because, I mean, as long as the technical designers do have classified access, then we can have a full range of conversation. And if they don't have classified access, then obviously that will inhibit some conversations. But, yeah. <laughs> but I don't think it'll be completely detrimental. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, what we're going to do right now is we're going to. We're gonna um, transition, so we need to just kind of hand over um, between mics and do a quick handoff. So we're gonna take a 10 minute break, um, run to the bathroom, get a drink, um, and then we'll start the next session at 9.45. And then again, if you have additional questions, we'll kind of be up here up at the front if you wanna come ask us off offline. <laughs>